Hello and welcome to day five of Zoology Live from the Museum of Zoology. I'm Ros Wade, I'm the Learning Officer at the Museum and I've been your guide this week on this wonderful week of wildlife. Today we will be exploring nighttime wildlife. We'll be going moth trapping with moth expert Annette Shelford and then bat detecting with bat expert Henry Stanier. Remember both of our experts will be here live to answer your questions after their films so do get those ready for us in the comments. But before we step into the world of nocturnal animals, we've been setting some challenges for you this week. Take part and you could be in with the chance of winning one of our mini beast explorer kits. So here's Sarah and Matt from the museum to show you our Lego challenge and recycled mix challenge. Hello, I'm Sarah. And I'm Matt. You would usually see us at the Museum of Zoology. While we've been staying safe at home, we have rediscovered our love for creating things, particularly using Lego. This week for Zoology Live, we challenge you to build an animal that you have seen recently using Lego bricks. Matt, are you ready to give it a go? Okay, here we go. I've made a butterfly, complete with proboscis and warning eye spots on its wings. I've been seeing a lot of these out and about on sunny days, so why not give it a go and create some wildlife that you've seen. Excellent stuff. We would love to see what you've created, so please do share photos of your creations with us via social media using the hashtag ZoologyLive or by emailing them to umzc at zoo.cam.ac.uk. These will be entered into a prize draw to win a wildlife exploration kit on Monday the 29th of June. But come back on Saturday the 27th of June to see all of the makes sent through during the week. Good luck! This week for Zoology Live, we are challenging you to make something from recycled materials found around your home, such as bottles or card. This is my moth that I created with movable wings. Or from around your garden or green spaces. So collect things such as leaves or twigs, stones, and see if you can make a collage or sculpture out of what you find. Take a look at our Recycled Makes Challenge page on the blog to find out how you can get involved. We would love to see what you've created, so please do share photos of your creations with us on social media using the hashtag ZoologyLive or by emailing them to umzc at zoo.cam.ac.uk. These will be entered into a prize draw to win a wildlife exploration kit on Monday the 29th of June. Your materials can then be recycled or returned back to nature, so we are creating things and helping the planet too. Come to our Zoology Live page on Saturday the 27th of June to see all of the makes, including yours, that have been sent in during the week. Good luck! And so to today's show. Annette Shelford has been monitoring the moths in her garden for several years now and she's put together this film showing us how and why. And remember Annette will be joining us after her film so do get your questions ready for her in the comments. 
Hello, welcome to my garden. Um, my name's Annette and um, for my work I'm a freelance learning consultant so I work with museums to help them to do science learning. What I much more enjoy is what I do the rest of the time which is to be an amateur moth recorder. So I'm really really fascinated with moths and have been for about four years since a friend loaned me a moth trap when I was too ill to go out bird watching and I suddenly realised there were all these amazing animals flying around in the dark in my back garden that I had no idea existed. I mean who wouldn't be into moths if you could see things like this in your garden? This is an elephant hawk moth. It turned up in my moth trap this morning so it was flying around last night and it's brand new. Can you see it's absolutely fresh and beautiful there's no scales missing off its body really 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 shiny and it's just started it's just emerged from its pupa probably in the last 24 hours and it's been off looking for a mate and then it'll go to its food plant which is something like rose bay willow herb they like and also fuchsias which you might have in your garden so who knows you could have these in your garden too so a moth trap works like this you have a big bucket and i put a cloth in the bottom to stop things getting wet we fill it up with egg, egg boxes and that's where the moths that fly in can kind of hide. So they like to fly to light, but then they like to kind of hide from it. Again, not quite sure why, but that's what they do. And that keeps them nice and safe till morning. Because what we don't want is for the moths to be attracted to the light and then just hang out and for a bird to come down at dawn before I manage to get out of bed and then just eat them all up. And birds do get into moth traps, but we try and stop them from doing that as much as we can. They've got a nice collar on it. And that, that helps the light be able to see what's inside the moth trap. It also keeps the, the, the animals that are inside bathed in a nice light. And here we have the business end of it. This is a mercury vapour bulb. And it's quite a special bulb. It's very bright light, but it's got quite a lot of a UV to it because it's got mercury vapour inside the bulb, hence the name. Not very nice stuff, but it's fine when it's contained in a bulb and safely used. Um, that emits quite a lot of ultraviolet, which is the sort of like beyond the blue end of the spectrum. So we can't see it, but lots and lots of animals can. And moths seem to seem to like that, as do many other insects. And the theory goes that give a moth a nice bright light. Here's my stunt moth borrowed from my cat. They will sort of be fluttering around. And they can be flying quite high up, or they might be flying in the garden. We're not quite sure where most of the moths are coming from around here, but I know full well that they come over the roof sometimes. They'll fly in and they'll be distracted by the light. And sometimes they'll just settle near the light. Quite often I find them here. I run a sheet at the back of my moth trap as well because some just like to hang out on the sheet. So it bathes in light and it's quite nice and safe. But a lot of them will fly around a bit and then dive into the moth trap and I'll find them there next morning. Perfectly safe and then I can catalogue them, identify them and then release them. So most nights when I run my moth traps, the light traps, uh, the last thing I do before I go to bed is just to sort of go outside, have a quick wander around the garden and have a little bit of a look. Oh, here's a moth. It's actually a moth. Can you see that fluttering? Fantastic. Oh, that's fab. So, on the edge of the trap here on the outside, we've got a bright yellow moth. This is a brimstone moth not to be confused with the brimstone butterfly. It's smaller, but can you see, it's not a brown moth. And that was a little micro moth just flying away. It's one of the longhorns, so hopefully we'll see that tomorrow because they're fabulous. So we've actually got some moths flying around. Oh, and here's another one. This is, now these, these are my nemeses. And this is a group of moths called pugs. They're small and brown and quite, quite fascinating. So they all look just about the same. There's not a huge amount flying around tonight, but there are a few flies and there's obviously that lovely bright yellow brimstone moth hanging out on the trap, which means there are a few moths flying, as there always are this time of year. It's a great time of year for mothing. Um, so hopefully there'll be a few more for us to have a look at tomorrow morning. Um, and yeah, on that note, good night. Okay, so I've um, got the moth trap here. So I closed this off um, and took the light out and moved it to a nice, safe, cool place at about quarter to five this morning. That's why I'm a bit croaky this morning. <laughs> um, we're going to have a look inside. So inside are some of the things that were flying around last night and we're just going to find out what it is. Every time you open up a moth trap, you've got no idea what you're going to find inside. It might be nothing, it might be loads. So probably things are going to fly out and there's all sorts of things in there. It's not just moths that fly for moth light. There's other flies and all sorts of flying insects as well. Ooh, so on here we've got tiny little tortrix, that's a type of micro moth. That's the dominant number of species that we've got in the UK. And 
I'm not even going to try and show off by knowing what that one is, so I'm going to put that one in a pot and keep it safely so I can photograph it a little bit later. So gently ease it into a pot and it'll be absolutely fine in there as long as I keep it nice and safe and cool. That's what I do because, you know, I'm not an expert. I've only been doing this for a few years and I'm still constantly learning. Um, so it's always really helpful to be able to ask other people's opinions by photographing them. Here's one that I do know. This is another moth that's just started flying. These fly in the sort of the early, the sort of the late spring, early summer. This is called a common swift. You can see it's shaking a little bit, hopefully. And um, that's warming up its wings to fly off. So these are quite primitive moths. I right? sort of, they're one of the, the sort of the oldest types of species. They do tickle. You see he's got little short stubby antennae. This is a male. And the males quite often have little sticky out abdomens. So have a look inside the trap. So what we've got are a bunch of egg boxes, which we, you saw how we arranged. And the moths just sort of like to hide inside there. There goes something. I'm just going to take one egg box out at a time and see what we've got inside. <laughs> I'm laughing because this is the start of an army arriving. This is a moth called a large yellow underwing. Let's see if we can get that in the light. There we go, it's a little bit of a better view. Spider's been having fun. Ooh. And we've got a pug moth. And that's off as well. I think that was probably a common pug, but I'm really not very good at them. And I do have another one identical to that that I potted this morning. Now, last night, when I was filming, before I went to bed, I saw something flying about and I thought it was probably one of these. Isn't that an extraordinary moth? And one of the things that attracted me to moths in the first place is just their extraordinary range of adaptations, the way they disguise themselves as bits of leaf, bits of twig, and in the case of this one, a wood chip, like a woodpecker would peck out of a tree. Um, so just basically to hide during the day because obviously they're very, very important food for birds and all sorts of other animals. That's when they're flying at night and birds during the day. Um, and this is a moth called a pale prominent. They're extraordinary things. I'll put in my thumb there. Amazingly, they, they just, yeah, the way they ravel their, ring, their wings up inside. <laughs> Moths are just so diverse and amazing. You don't necessarily need to use a moth trap to find signs of moth activity in your garden. This is our garden. Um, you can look for moths flying during the day. There are lots of species of day flying moths. I think there's something like 50. I'll need to check that figure at some point. And they come to lots and lots of flowers that uh, bees and other pollinators use. But one thing I found when I was looking um, at our nettle patch the other night was actually we've got probably some signs of some caterpillars, uh, caterpillars pupating inside the nettles. So I'm just going to put my nettle gloves on because they really do stink and it does itch. And we're going to have a look at these little structures. So I found these, and if you look closely, it's like something has rolled a cigar from the nettle. And if you look carefully there, can you see there's very, very, ouch, stung, very, very fine strands of silk in there. And I think that is where a moth larva or a caterpillar possibly a butterfly larva, I'm not sure, has um, gone to pupate. And a lot of moths and butterflies and some beetles make this sort of structure so they can go from their larval stage, their sort of caterpillar or larva, um, into their adult stage. And I did have a bit of a look. One of these had sprung open down here as so I had a bit of a look inside just to see what was going on. And if you look closely, I'll just pull this leaf off because there's nothing there anymore. And you see inside the telltale signs, please don't pull them apart. What we can see is we've got some silk here where it's spun its sort of web to protect itself and hold itself in place. And all of this black stuff here is frass, also known as caterpillar poo. So that's a sign that a caterpillar has pupated and then emerged as a, a moth or a butterfly, not sure which. Um, at some point in the last few days, it obviously nibbled its way out or broken its way out through the end of the nettle, which was open. I could see inside, so I could check there was no caterpillar in there. I hope I've been able to show you a little bit of the um, excitement and, and intricacy of moth trapping, and I really, really encourage you to have a go. 
So I'm going to finish just showing you these two little beauties. And these both turned up in my trap last night. One of them was outside the trap and I only just found it about 10 minutes ago, hanging on a, um, a strand of poppy, which is rather beautiful near one of the moth traps. So these are buff tip moths and they're about the size of my little finger. One's a bit bigger than the other, can you see? And that's a female. So we've got a male and a female. So who knows, after dark tonight, when I release them, these two might start producing the next generation. What a brilliant thought. And now I'm joined live by Annette. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful film. Often when we think of moths, we think of things that are quite brown and grey and drab, but I think that's clearly not the case, is it? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, before I started looking at moths, I just thought the little brown things that eat my jumpers in the house and yeah. sort of sometimes fly around candles when we're having a barbecue. But, you know, the last four years that I've been trapping have been an absolute revelation. There's just such a diversity of moths out there. And there are some absolutely brilliantly coloured ones, which you'd never expect. Because, of course, they're trying to avoid being eaten during the day mm -hmm. and they don't want to be seen. But there are some incredible colour adaptations out there. Yeah. Yeah. So you take part in the, um, is it the Garden Moth Scheme? Can you tell us a bit about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, Garden Moth Scheme is um, one of the data recording things for moths. So um, when you're sort of moth trapping, it's a really good thing to also keep records because they can then contribute to science. So um, Garden Moth Scheme is just one of the ways that you can actually use your records and contribute to what we know about where moths are and, and, and that's obviously important for understanding of biodiversity locally. So Garden Moth Scheme, um, you trap in a specific spot on the same mm -hmm. night every week and record that way. So it's a slightly more scientific way than most moth trapping, which people tend to put the moth trap out in the best place in the garden mm -hmm. on a night where the weather looks really good. So people will trap a lot more this time of year than they will later in the year or earlier in the year because there's lost species of moths flying around. So, but um, also most of the data I produce the rest of the time goes to something called the National Moth Recording Scheme, which um, contributes to all sorts of other things as well. Um, and the most recent production of that, so I contributed wow. this, and so my data went into this. So it's the Atlas of Moths of Britain Island. So this is. Um, a huge piece of work um, mm -hmm. and it, it's like lots of things like this it goes out of date pretty much as soon as it's been published because of course there's new records coming in all the time mm -hmm. but this is kind of the state of play for moths um, and their abundance and diversity and distribution across the UK so if anybody's interested in finding out what they can potentially see in their back gardens this is a good place to start really yeah. really amazing book and I'm proud that I was able to contribute to it not very much yes. but a little bit <laughs> no, <I didn't>. yeah, <laughs> the next edition no more of my stuff <laughs> <laughs> so we've had a number of questions coming in so I'm going to go to some of our audience questions one Ooh. is and I'm going to change this question slightly so that it's um fits with what we've been talking about so when Jen Knight asks what is your favorite butterfly but I'm going to ask you what's your favorite moth do you have a favorite moth Oh Lord, I was really scared you were going to ask me this one because oh. <laughs> anybody who knows me, especially most of my moth trapping friends, will just be going, oh goodness, I pretty much like anything that's cute and furry or shiny. Mm -hmm. um, if, I ha if I was asked to pick a favourite, oh, at the moment it's probably a little moth called burnished brass, which mm -hmm. is about that big. It's got a body that's it's got a kind of tented shape to it. So it's one of that, that sort of group of moths. They've got slightly tented bodies, but they've got um, structural colour, so they look metallic on the side of them. Mm, and they lovely. glint in the light like just like a little piece of pyrite. Mm -hmm. So anybody who knows what pyrite looks like falls gold. If you think of that in moth form, that sort of burnished brass is, and they are pretty cool, quite that special. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Gorgeous. <laughs> I think that's one the, the one that you use for the cover actually. Oh, the, uh, yeah. For the event picture. So it's that one, yeah. That one, yeah. Um, how do you trap moths? I would usually just pick it up. I mean, I'm guessing that's sort of, how do you get them in the pots once you've sort of caught them in the trap? Um, very carefully. So I think I mentioned, um, it didn't make it into the film, but a really useful piece of tool mm -hmm. is a small paintbrush. Um, so you can knock them gently out of the um, egg boxes that they settle in, or if they're on a plant, just gently ease them onto the egg box. Um, some of the moths, um, I. I can show you this one now if you like. Oh, um, yes. Here's, nice one from, here's one I found earlier. 
<laughs> There's another cute one. Okay, so sometimes oh. they, especially some of the bigger moths, so this is an elephant hawk moth, which I showed at the beginning of my film. Mm -hmm. And these have been doing quite well this year. It's, I've seen more than ever before this year, which has been wonderful because they're really cheering and pink. Yeah. See, who'd expect a pink moth? Um, <laughs> but I just ease these ones onto a piece of twig. They're quite happy to sort of walk onto your finger and then walk onto a piece of twig. So you're just, mm -hmm. the main thing is, if you're ever handling animals, just to be really, really careful and gentle. Yeah. They are really fragile. I have to confess, elephant hawk moths are one of my favourite moths. I think they're beautiful. They're really gorgeous. It's hard not, it's hard not to love them, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got some international viewers as well. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> How diverse are moths in the UK? There are over 100 species where I live in Singapore, but it's not very well studied. No, and it's interesting. Um, the UK, I think, is one of the best studied places for moths, partly because we're a fairly small island, so it's fairly easy to sort of find things. Um, so I think at the last count, there are about two and a half thousand species of moths, approximately, mm -hmm. and about 800, I've got this written down somewhere just so I didn't get it wrong, uh, 869 of them are macro moths, so they're the bigger moths. And the rest are divided into, I think it's about 1,300 micromoths and the rest are butterflies, which is about 70. Gosh, yeah. So there's <laughs> a huge them. number of moths. <laughs> <laughs> I said in my film, actually, that there are about 50 day-flying moth species. Yeah. And I checked that, as I promised I would, and actually that's wrong. So there's about 60 species of butterfly that fly mm -hmm. during the day that we're used to seeing. Um, there are three times that many day-flying moths or moths wow. that will fly during the day. Yeah. I know, it's extraordinary. Some of them are really tiny, but they are there. Yeah, there. <laughs> so this kind of links nicely onto another question we've got from Evelyn, aged seven. Are there different names for moths? And if there are, do you know all of them? If there's that many, I'm thinking, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to remember that many. <laughs> I don't know all of them, but I'm trying to learn. So I know the names and I can recognise most of the moths that I've seen over the last four years. And it's been something, starting to do this as I get a little bit older. So, you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I was really proud that I, my memory would still retain the names. Um, and I tend to, like most other moth trappers who are amateurs, I tend to use the vernacular names or the English names. Mm -hmm. But because some of the micro moths especially only have their kind of Latin or their taxonomic names, I learned those as well. So this morning, a, a, a moth started coming back, which is called Endotrichia flammialis, which sounds wonderful. It sounds like yeah. a fan or something. And actually, that's kind of the shape the moth is as well. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting quite good at learning names, but I don't know all of them yet. I'm, I'll yeah. get there. Give me 10 years, maybe. <laughs> okay. If I see them, I'll know them. <laughs> Thanks, Evelyn. That's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> And also linked to what you were saying earlier, and I think this is a bit of math I can't do off the top of my head. How, what percentage oh. of English moths go out in the daytime? That's from Madeline, age 10. So it sounds like about 10%, uh, something like that. Right, Madeline, I think you might need to get your calculator out, please. Yeah. So <laughs> there's about 160 species of day flying moths and two and a half thousand species of moths. So if you can do that for me on your calculator, on your phone or something, and give us the answer by the end of it, we'll give you a clap. Yeah, I'd really like <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah, I think um, that'd be quite good. <laughs> <laughs> Why are butterflies and moths different colours? That's another question we've been asked. They're different colours because they are evolving to kind of suit the time of day and the environment in which they want to be seen and they don't want to be seen. So um, lots of people think of moths as brown things and actually a lot of moths are brown because they're essentially, they've evolved to look like bits of leaf litter, partly because that's where they hang out during the day, partly that's because where they first emerge um, after they've pupated in the ground. It just gives them the best chance of not being picked off by a bird before their wings have even did. So, and, and that kind of gives them a sort of like bit longer time flying around. Some of the brighter moths are bright to, um, like some of the butterflies, they're bright to attract attention of mates sometimes because some do have quite good sight. Um, but things like eye spots, which people are familiar with on butterflies, mm -hmm. but moths do have as well. Think about there's a big, fantastic day flying moth called an emperor moth, which is one to look out for. Mm -hmm. and they're really stunning things that's one of my other favorites um they have eye spots as well and they use those they move their wings as well as having the color to sort of like to show to sort of make themselves appear and disappear and to look like a predator and to disappear that mm -hmm. so 
yeah, they've got all sorts of different colours for different reasons. Yeah. Just helping yeah. them blend in, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's like most of the animal world. Yeah. Trying not to be... Blending in and standing out. Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, Verity, age six, would like to know how many moths have you seen? Have you got a list of how, how many, many moths have I seen? So I did do a quick check earlier. So when I knew I was going to be doing this interview, I did something I've been meaning to do for a couple of years and went through all my moth records mm -hmm. and made a list for all the species of moths I found in my garden. And that totals 370 species. Wow, that's and I added two new, yeah, two new species this morning as well that I've never seen before. Oh, so the tight little tiny ones, but that was mm -hmm. quite cool. Yeah. And to think, you know, I'm in a suburban garden in Cambridge and I really, really would not have believed when I started that I would be seeing that many species. And I've only been doing this a few years. I've had 10 new species this year. Yeah. So they do, yeah. yeah. It just depends what the weather's doing, which way the wind's blowing, what date I trap. It's, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> do you know how many types of moth there are in Ireland? Um, similar to us? There's... It's similar, it's different. Um, I know my friend Stuart will be shouting at the TV screen now if he's watching, because he could tell me straight off the top of his head. I don't know exactly. There are slightly less species, um, and some that are less abundant here are more abundant in parts of Ireland as well, just because of the habitat um, and the, just the, you know, tractor wilderness and, and that sort of thing. But I don't know exactly, I'm afraid. That's something else you could probably look up. If I find the answer out, I'll put it in the, in the responses. Okay, great. Um, another question from Evelyn. Uh, do moths make sounds? Oh, now that is a good question. Yeah. And that is something I read up on earlier, actually. So moths can make a variety of sounds. So moths have cut, one of the reasons moths have evolved the way they have is partly to sort of like protect them during the day, but it's also to escape their main predators at night, which are bats. So there's this, I'm sure Henry will talk about this, he's the next person. Um, but there's this amazing evolutionary arms race between moths and bats. So some moths can um, jam the so sonic sounds that the bats make to try and pick up their prey. So you know bats are constantly sending out these um, sound signals and the way they bounce off flies and moths and things will tell them where they are. So moths actually can make a sound. They've got this, um, this not all species, just some, but they've got an organ in their abdomen called timbals and they sort of rub them together. If you imagine like two violin strings or two... Um, guitar strings rubbing together really really fast at a really really high pitch that's the sort of thing we're talking about and that's at the frequent same frequency that the bats will be using so they've evolved alongside a kind of like a main species a main predator species and they, that will that's like several times out of 10 will stop the bat from finding them it just makes their outline a little bit fuzzier yeah. as far as the bat's concerned so it's more likely to miss so that's pretty cool so that's yeah. a survival one and the best known one i think is probably the death's head hawk moth yeah. which is for those I'm sure everybody's seen a death head hawk moth they're kind of quite goth and quite quite cool so it's a big black and orange thing with something that looks like a skull on the back of its neck they can squeak so one of the ways they get food is by raiding beehives for honey or bees nests for honey and they squeak to mim mimic the queen bee so the workers will let them in mm -hmm. and they can steal some honey and then get out again safely that's pretty oh, cool, that's pretty cool. <laughs> very sneaky uh, yeah, very devious. <laughs> Gilby, aged 11, asks, uh, what is the most endangered moth in Britain? Ooh, I don't know the most endangered moth, but I know one of the um, rarest is a moth called the Kentish Glory, mm -hmm. um, which is only found in a very small area in Scotland now. And it's a beautiful, beautiful moth. It's, uh, it's one of the big sort of furry ones with kind of beautiful shaped wings with eyes so I think it's partly day flying. I've never seen one, it was one, one, one of my bucket list mm -hmm. actually um, and there's a big conservation program um, involved around that moth um, yeah. but it's yeah I, that's the rarest one I know about. There are lots of other moths which are very endangered, there's some um, down in Dorset which have got restricted areas, there's another moth called Fisher's Estuarine moth which is restricted to a few um, salt marsh areas. I know there's a site in Essex, I went looking for caterpillars but didn't find any. Um, mm. So yeah, there's quite a few. Mm. Moths are, like every other insect, very, very sensitive and some more sensitive than others. And when their habitat's being lost or used for different things, they can be very, very drastically affected by it as well. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Josh, age seven. Are moths similar to butterflies? Yes, they are, Josh. Um, they're all part of a, a big group 
and I think Matt talked a bit about this when he was talking about butterflies mm -hmm. the other day. They're all part of a group called Lepidoptera. Um, moths, I think, have been, moths and butterflies have been split off because they have slightly different behaviours and um, obviously moths largely fly at night and butterflies largely fly during the day. And some people say, oh, moths will have fuzzy antennae like feathers or cones, whereas butterflies tend to have antennae with clubs. And mm -hmm. there's, other, there's various other things as well. But there are always exceptions that prove the rule. Uh, there are lots of, there are several night flying butterflies. There are quite a lot of day flying moths. Um, mm. There are some moths with, there are some butterflies with antennae that aren't quite right, like the skippers. So it's quite hard to divvy them up. So yeah. I think, I try to think of them all as Lepidoptera, but yeah. moths are the ones I'm most interested in because they tend to sit still more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're a bit easier to look at. Well, I trained to work with, I trained working with fossils which don't move around very much. Yeah. So moths are a nice progression into the biological world. Yeah. <laughs> We've had another question. Um, why, why do moths, fly at people do we have an idea why they might fly oh yeah so quite often people make light and moths mm. like light that's why light traps work and nobody's quite sure why moths fly to light but i'm guessing the question asked the person who's asked the question has had a lamp outside or found something has flown into their room when they've had the light mm. on and it's dark outside and moths just fly to light and we think it's something to do with their navigation but yeah, there's lots. Of, there's a couple of conflicting theories, and I'm not entirely sure. It seems to be one of these arguments that goes round and round. Um, yeah. But yeah, moths will fly to light, and chances are that's why you tend to find them flying into your bedroom windows at this time of year when you've got lights on, and it's hot outside, so your windows are open. So they're not flying mm -hmm. at you; they're flying towards the light, and then they get a bit confused by it. Yeah. And it's just bad luck if they do fly. So do be kind to them, and just if you can, stick them in a jam jar slide a bit of paper underneath and then just take them outside and put them back into the dark. That would be my okay. recommendation. Uh, that, that answers another one of the questions we've had, so that's brilliant. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> another question, what plants do moths like? Because they're pollinators as well, aren't they? Moths. moths are really important pollinators. Yeah, there was a piece of research published earlier this year, which I still haven't read the whole of because I've not been very well. But um, yeah, it's it's now been proven moths have been studied to find out how much pollen they carry on their bodies. And of course, because moths have got furry bodies largely, sticky pollen sticks to fur, so they're definitely going around pollinating things. Um, if you want to garden for moths specifically, um, plant things that are nicely scented, particularly at night. Mm -hmm. So the other evening, unfortunately, it was just too late to put into the film. Um, we found an elephant hawk moth nectaring on our jasmine plant, uh, yeah. which was really cool. I was so pleased to see it. We don't get a lot of moths nectaring here. Um, moths like buddleia as well. If you go out, if you've got buddleia in your garden, if it started flowering yet or it starts flowering in the next few weeks, on a sort of a hot, muggy night like you've had the last few nights, go out with a torch and go and have a look at the buddleia and there will be moths nectaring on it. And there's moth species like silver wye in particular, which mm -hmm. seem to really, really like buddleia, but you get all sorts of species on it. Um, but as for other plants, remember moths are uh, caterpillars, which are um, the larva form of moths, like butterflies, they, they eat plants. So having a whole range of wild plants and native plants in your garden is going to be great for moths as well. So think about privet hawk moth, that's got it in its name, it, the caterpillars eat privet. Um, the elephant hawk moth, as I said in the film, they really like um, rose bay willow herb, but they will also eat fuchsia. Mm -hmm. um, the um, cigar rolls that I found in the um, nettles, I think that's a moth called a mother of pearl. Mm -hmm. And they like nettles, lots of things like nettles, so that's a really, really good plant. But yeah, pretty much all native British plants will have a moth or a butterfly whose larva feeds on it. Yeah. So they're all really good to plant in your garden. Yeah. Look out for them and go look for caterpillars if you've got them. Yeah, <laughs> so that answers, that answers a question from Charlotte, age eight, who wanted to know uh, whether moths have the same life cycle as butterflies but essentially they do don't they with the caterpillar and they the... do pretty much exactly yeah um i think moths are a little bit more diverse in where they're in in having different sort of like silk cocoons and things rather than the pupas that butterflies mm -hmm. have but essentially it's a complete metamorphosis metamorphosis and i know matt talked about that again the other day so mm -hmm. they basically yeah. start with the caterpillar eat a lot <laughs> go somewhere safe curl up encase themselves turn into mush and then a few weeks to a few months later, depending on the life cycle of the moth, um, that something ad the adult moth will emerge. And it's just really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gilby, age eleven, asks, "Have you ever seen a death's head hawk moth?" I haven't. No, mm. no. Um, only in museum collections. 
Um, I know somebody who has, <laughs> and a genuine one. I was um, I was on holiday in Sussex, so most people kind of have a. We have lots of Facebook groups where we talk to each other, and that's how I, I got to learn a lot about moths. And that's where if I if I get stuck with an ID, especially for some of the tiny micros, I'll post a photo, and people will help me to identify them. So that's something if you do start getting into moths, it's worth being aware of. There's some great Facebook groups out there, um, and I posted on a Facebook group that I had trapped a moth called a Clifton nonpareil, which is another absolutely massive moth. And it's mm -hmm. one that is, is starting to expand around the south east and the east of England. It used to be quite exclusively in Kent and Sussex, and it's spreading out now. Um, and I trapped one in Sussex. And I mentioned online that I had one, and I got a, a message about an hour later saying, oh, can I come and see it, from a guy who <laughs> lives just around the corner. Um, so I had three people come to visit this moth and we were just sort of talking about things and this guy was telling me the story of finding a death's hood hawk moth caterpillar on his back doorstep, having mm -hmm. no idea where it had come from. So that's my closest encounter with the death's head hawk, other than obviously watching movies that it's in and, and seeing them in museums. I'd like yeah. to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this sort of links perhaps a little to a question from Eloise, aged six, uh, who would like to know what the rarest moth is in the UK. I mean, does the death's head hawk moth? Well, ones. we sort of talked about that already, didn't we? Yeah. We talked about endangered moths, and I think uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of um, rare moths. So there's the Kentish Glory that I mentioned before. There's Fisher's Estuarine. There's um, some very very sort of specific. There's a uh, there's a moth I think called Bloxworth Snout, which is quite rare. Um, mm -hmm. There's yeah, there's several. But I can't. I can't put names to them. If I haven't seen them, I don't know what they are. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. But it's worth. Um, if you're interested in finding out about endangered moths, you could look at the, have a look at the butterfly conservation website, mm -hmm. where they do have lists of species. Um, and they talk. They there's, they published a report called Moths Matter, last year, which was very much about. Um, of how sadly, quite a lot of the British population. I think it's something like seventy four percent of us, really don't like moths. Oh. because they do yeah. things like flying into windows and sort of seeming to fly at us and because they have this reputation for eating our nice sweaters mm -hmm. um, and things like that. People just don't like moths particularly. So they commissioned a big research project um, a few years ago and that has got a really, really useful list of species that are in decline. I mean, all moth species are in decline, like the vast majority of insects. Yeah. Um, but there are certain ones, because their habitat is being threatened by building work or climate change, a combination of all mm. sorts of different things, um, they really need some help. Felicity, age seven, would like to know whether moths and butterflies get on with each other and do they ever interact? Well, I presume they must do because they share food plants. Um, it's like butterfly species, you quite often see a red admiral chasing off a, um, a white butterfly, don't you? I was watching that on my plants this morning. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know whether moths have a pecking order in the same way birds do for nectar, but I don't know, they, def they will definitely interact because they're all sharing the sky and they're sharing food sources, but I have no idea how that works. Yeah, That's a really interesting thing to think about actually, that's a really good question, yeah. I have no idea. There, there are probably people out there who can answer that, but I'm afraid I can't, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if I can find out, I'll, I'll, I'll put something in the notes. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Um, so, Averell, and I have to apologise to, to Averell because I pronounced your name wrong yesterday, really sorry, um, but she would like to know, um, what moths are the calmest and that you put them on your hand the easiest? Oh, yeah. So there are two sort of main groups of moths. They're divided mostly into um, noctuids and geometrids. And as a rule, for a starter, the noctuids are the much more calm ones. They're the ones that just kind of play dead if if they're kind of threatened or they feel something approaching or they're the ones that can also drop, they can hear bats coming and they can also drop out the sky to avoid bats so they employ that. And they have a tendency to sort of like just calmly sleep during the night. There are always exceptions to this rule. There's a few species that are really lively, but that actually helps you identify them. Um, whereas the geometrids, the one which, ones which look a bit more butterfly shaped, they tend to be a bit livelier and a bit kind of friskier, is the word my, my body and I use quite a lot. Um, so they're the ones that are terribly hard to get photos of for a start. Um, friendliest ones, hawk moths are lovely. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be the bigger they are, the calmer they are. Not always, again, but quite often. Um, and uh, poplar hawk moths and um, elephant hawks in particular, I've got a friend who refers to them as Velcro moths because they've got really sticky feet. 
and you can you can actually go around you can wear them and I wasn't going I, I thought about doing it for this but I thought no, that might be a bit risky and it's not mm -hmm. really the right message but you can wander around with them attached to your clothing and there have been times when I've trapped two or three of them and I've put them on my jumper to, while I was doing something else and they just sat there so they're yeah they're probably the calmest there's another really cute moth called black arches which mm -hmm. is um looks like a it's just beautiful it's just black and white zigzag so it looks like a, a Bridget Riley piece of art with antennae mm -hmm. basically um and they're pretty chilled as well yeah. so yeah the ones yeah. that I've got most photos of are generally the most chilled ones <laughs> <laughs> and just a couple more audience questions from Evelyn age seven um who would like to know how long do moths live and do moths mate or does the female just lay the eggs well, let's start with the mating first. So to reproduce, all animals have to mate unless they can reproduce asexually, and moths do mate. So at the end, in, at the end of my film, I showed you two buff tip moths. They're a male and female, and they would have to mate. Um, some people this year have been sending me photos that they found in their gardens, some of my friends, because obviously people have been spending a lot more time in their gardens this year, so it's been great. I've had this like constant stream of what's this <laughs> sort of photos. And moths will mate end to end, like a lot of other insects. So you might find on a fence or on a tree, mm -hmm. two moths stuck together, and that's them mating. Mm -hmm. And then the male will fly off, and the female will lay her eggs. They usually, a lot of moths will mate on or very close to the larval food plant, so she doesn't risk having to fly too far and exposing herself if there's birds if it's during the day or bats if it's at night. So yeah, they tend to hang out near their food plants, which is why yeah. if you want moths in your garden, plant the right plants for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was the other question? Sorry, it was a good um, one, wasn't it? And um, how long do they live? How long do they live? That's really mm. variable. So I don't know the absolute answer to that. Bigger moths and moths that feed tend to live much longer than smaller moths. Um, and the moths like the, um, I think I showed you a common swift moth in the film, they don't have mouth parts, they can't feed as adults, so mm -hmm. they basically have quite a short lifespan and they have to get everything done, so basically they mate and that's job done, whereas I think the, some of the bigger hawk moths and the ones that nectar at least have a little bit of fun. Um, but some moths um, need to feed because they, they migrate long distances as well, there's some hawk moths that come over from Europe later in the summer. So. Some of them can fly huge distances, they can live for weeks. And then of course, thinking about this, there are moths that live for months and months and months because they um, go into diapause over the winter. So mm -hmm. there's a moth called a herald, which is one that overwinters an adult. So they stop flying in sort of September time. These are beautiful, they look like shields made out of sort of leather, which are kind of like um, covered in copper. It's like orange copper scales. They're very beautiful things, mm -hmm. really, really distinctive if you see one. Um, and they will winter, they will overwinter, so they'll basically shut themselves down, sort of hibernation um, over the winter and only come out again when the temperature's right. So look yeah. out for those if you've got kind of like sheds or outhouses, you might find moths in there. Just the same way you might find peacock butterflies, there are some moths that overwinter too. Fantastic. And one last question, um, and apologies if we have, we've had loads of questions, so apologies if we haven't answered all of them. We will try and get answers to, the, to them on our social media. Um, but one last question, one I'm asking all of our experts this week. Do you have a top wildlife spot or is there something that you haven't seen yet that you really want to? Ooh, I think my top wildlife spot is a tiny little moth that I caught um, a few weeks ago, actually, which is a really, really amazing thing. And it's, it's a tiny little micro moth called Theocroa shrubizana. And who doesn't love a name that starts with a silent PT? Um, <laughs> I love a pit silent pea. Um, it's a tiny, tiny little moth, and it's got two cousins that I know quite well. There's one called Theocroa rugosana, which is a, mm -hmm. a, my favourite micro moth because it looks like it's made out of beaten silver and studded with um, rubies and sapphires. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, tiny little intricate thing. This little one, it's kind of, it looks more like it's made out of gold and studded with sort of like shiny black diamonds and sapphires. And I spent I, I got some decent photographs of it and I spent weeks trying to work out what it was and in the end I sent some pictures to a friend and he came back to me and said oh it's this one and it's one it's it's rare it's not even in books mm -hmm. um, and it's actually the first record in Cambridgeshire since the 1920s and it's the first ever record for Cambridge so I think that counts as my best spot because it's yeah. a really really rare and really beautiful yeah. so that was a good one for me and as for things I'd like to see I've got a slightly random moth bucket list 
um, <laughs> which are not probably not the same sort of bucket list that most other moth trappers have, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I don't conform. Um, there are some moths um, which have really, really fantastic, beautiful names, really charismatic names. Um, mm -hmm. So there's one called uh, Anomalous. There's one called the Sorcerer. There's one called the Exile. There's a Suspected. There's an Alchemist. There's a Silurian. There's a Geometrician. Um, and my favourite one, I think, is one called the Latin, which looks mm -hmm. like a, a frock that somebody wears for um, one of the uh, uh, um, ballroom uh, dances oh. in Strictly. It's just all feathers. <laughs> it's pink and feathery looking. So most of those are kind of like rare immigrant moths. Yeah. And like, if I went to Europe and went and did trapping there, I could probably go see them. But there's I just really love the names. There's a real poetry yeah. to some of the names of moths, and that's it it's, like there's something quite, yeah. It's there's a there's an amazing book that came out a couple of years ago, which is about the naming of uh, butterflies and moths, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic. It's a fascinating history. But there's yeah. some absolutely gorgeous names, um, and it's worth just getting to know moths to for the poetry of them as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for that. It was really really fascinating, and I hope everybody oh, you're very welcome. will um, see moths in a new light, and they don't just eat your sweaters. They're really beautiful animals as well. I really really hope so. Yeah. Thank you for okay. letting me come and talk to you all. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So that was really fascinating. And um, our research assistant, Matt Hayes, has recently started watching moths in his back garden. And here he is setting up a, a simple uh, moth trap. And we'll be back tomorrow uh, to show what he's been finding this week in his moth trap. To see the moths that live around me, I made a cheap bucket moth trap following instructions from Butterfly Conservation. The base is a deep bucket with small holes in the bottom to allow rain to drain out. Then I place egg boxes inside for the moths to hide under when they fall in the trap. The last section is the bucket lid, which has a large funnel inserted inside it and a UV reptile lamp attached on top inside a water bottle to keep out the rain. The moths get attracted to the light, hit the bottle and fall down the funnel into the bucket. Then simply plug in the light and switch it on as it gets dark. The moths will be there in the morning, safe and sound for you to observe and release them. This moth trap is really simple. All you'll need is a white sheet and a torch. Hang up the sheet in your garden or drape it over a piece of furniture. Then, as it gets dark, shine your torch on it and sit back and wait to see which moths get attracted to the light. So really looking forward to seeing what Matt's been finding with his moth trap this week. But now we're going to another group of fascinating nocturnal animals. Uh, here is Henry Stanier from the Wildlife Trust who shows us how to go back detecting. And remember, Henry will be with us after um, his film to answer your questions. So we've had a few already, but do send in your questions on the comments for Henry. Hi, my name's Henry Stanier and I work for the Wildlife Trust. I'm the Monitoring and Research Officer at the Great Fen, but tonight I'm at Camborne, just west of Cambridge, on the edge of Oakswood, part of Camborne Nature Reserve, and I'm listening for bats. Now bats are an amazing part of our local wildlife, very elusive, we know so little about them, but there's several species that occur at this wood, from the small pipistrel bats to the large noctual bat, and tonight they'll be on the wing, they're the only true flying mammal, and of course they use echolocation to find their way. Now although bats come out at night they've got perfectly good eyesight and of course they've got very good hearing and they'll be shouting as loud as they can at frequencies beyond the range of human hearing. And that's why I need my trusty bat detector so I can actually hear them because this is a piece of equipment that converts their high frequency calls into noises that I can hear which is great for me, so I can learn a bit more about our local wildlife. Now bats are mammals, and so in some cases they can live quite a while, they can live up to 30 years, and at this time of year, in the middle of summer, they'll have had their young. They often produce one pup, uh, sometimes two, but they need to be out and about hunting themselves to provide food for their young and so that's what I'm hoping to detect. Some bats often use regular flight routes to feed 
and that's what I'm counting on. I'm waiting here on one of the paths through Oakswood in the hope that one of the bats will come and fly past me. So I've got my bat detector ready. Just turn the volume up and what I'll do is I'll change the frequency to about 45 kilohertz. And that's the frequency at which the common pipistrelle bat shouts the loudest. That's its peak frequency, which makes it much easier to distinguish it as a species. So if I'm listening for common pipistrelles, tuning to about 45 kilohertz allows me to check to see if there's any in the area. The bats often produce calls a range of frequencies, but some species do have this peak frequency that I'm listening for. There's another species of bat in the area, the soprano pipistrelle, and not surprisingly, as the name suggests, it calls at a higher frequency to the common pipistrelle, about 55 kilohertz. So if we get one of those, I'll need to tune the bat detector to a slightly higher frequency to pick it up. And there we go. Now that little noise, that is a pipistrelle bat. The reason I know that is that if I look at my bat detector, you can see it's got a little read out there, and it's saying 46, over 46 kilohertz. And so that means that anything emitting a frequency at that reading, the bat detector will pick up and then convert into a sound that I can hear. And those popping and slapping noises are a pipistrelle bat sending out its calls, echolocating to detect its prey. So I'm here in the evening and there we go, I can hear a bat again, that's a pipistrelle. So the bat detector is fairly simple, it's got an on-off switch which is also the volume control so I can turn it down and turn it back up again and I can change the frequency as well. So if I turn it down to say 20 kilohertz, then anything using a call at 20 kilohertz, it will emit for me. And if I turn it higher to say about 45 kilohertz, I will also hear anything that's emitting a sound at 45 kilohertz. So it doesn't have to be a bat. It could be anything at all. It could be an insect. And it's possible that on warm summer evenings you may get other species as well. Grasshoppers, crickets in particular, they are calling at night and I expect to get those as well. So I'm just going to walk along a little way and see if I can hear any more bats. Quite a few bats like to follow a regular route as a fly through the night hunting for food and so you can soon pick up on these regular routes, these little foraging routes and pick up bats coming back and forth. Quite a few species will use the same route and they will use it every night but bats are quite opportunistic. They will take advantage of food when it comes available. So for example, you might get a night when you get the ants, the flying ants, taking off and all the bats will be in there picking them off as they fly into the air. But on other nights, they'll be out eating a lot of the, the midges and mosquitoes that perhaps you're not so um, happy about. They'll be intersecting you and they can eat hundreds, hundreds in a night. So they're our friends for many reasons. Well, that's something I didn't expect common toad. Little fellow out here on the path. Obviously it's nice dry and warm conditions and he's out hunting for insects as well. He's not bothered by the dry conditions, much more tolerant of the dry than frogs are. He's a quite a small little fellow but he's obviously out and about and enjoying the weather as well. Also, as you can see He's uh, not particularly big, but he's making for the grass, so he should be just fine. I'm just listening to see if there's anything else coming out at the moment. A 
and there you go. That's a pipistrel bed again, a common pipistrel. You can see me changing the frequency here. And that's what you do when you use a bat detector. You pick up a bat over the detector and then you change the frequency to see whether you can still pick it up. Because what you're trying to find is the frequency at which the sound of the bat is loudest. That's their peak frequency. And in a lot of species of bat, there's a figure that we have that tells us which species it is. It's quite a warm night. And we've just had a new moon. So in other words, it's nice and dark. There's no big, bright, glowing moon to provide extra light. And bats, they do vary in what they like at night. Some bats will fly up and down along a path where there are street lights and other bats don't like that at all. And so you will get different species according to the different lighting conditions you get. The pipistrels, the one that you heard earlier, which was a common pipistrel, uh, and I heard those because they shout loudest at 45 kilohertz, they don't seem to like mind light that much, but other species aren't so keen. Okay, well now hopefully I'm joined by Henry. I'm not sure your camera is working. Can you hear me, Henry? Okay, unfortunately, I think there's something um, wrong with our connection for the video call with Henry. Can you hear me yet? Oh, I'm really sorry about this. We're having a few problems in, in contacting But we've had some brilliant questions, um, so I'm hoping that Henry will be able to join us in just a second. We'll, we'll give him a, a give our internet just a, a little bit longer and hopefully we'll be able to make contact. Hello, can you? It's not quite coming through. I'm not quite sure why this is. Um, so we've got some fantastic questions. I'm hoping we can. Right, I think we're, we're going to have to um, call it a day for this one. I can't uh, get this, this uh, video call to work, unfortunately. But we will um, go through your questions and get, and get some answers to you, because there are some really brilliant questions in here, and I'm afraid I'm not able to answer them. So um, I'm really sorry that Henry's not been able to join us today. Yes, no, sorry, not been able to make make that work. I'm really, really sorry about that. So that's it for day five of uh, Zoology Live. Now, tomorrow is a little bit different. You can join us on the hour every hour from 11 till 4 tomorrow. And we have some great uh, zoology at home activities. So at 11 o'clock, we'll be finding out what Matt Hayes has been finding in his moth trap. And then at 12 o'clock, we'll be joined live by our curator of insects, Dr. Ed Turner. Ed will be there showing us what he's been finding in his pitfall traps this week. And also, um, he'll be there to answer all your mini beast related questions. So do get those ready for Ed. Uh, then at one o'clock, we're going back to Matt Hayes, and he will be showing us another insect surveying technique called beat netting. And he'll be showing you um, how to do that, what kind of thing you might find. And also, he'll be able to answer your questions live as well. At two o'clock, we will be pond dipping and I'll be joined by Frances Dipper again and she'll be helping me to identify what's in my pond and answer any of your aquatic animal related questions. Then at three o'clock, we have uh, Ellie Bladen here who will be telling us her top tips for making a wildlife film on a budget. And she will also be here to answer your questions live about filming animals. We will also be going through the top spots for the week and showing some of the makes and things like that that you've been sending photographs in of. So please do send in photos of all your Lego makes, recycled makes, things like that as well. And then at four o'clock, you can join us for our Zoology Live quiz. So that will be going live at four o'clock. And if you enter by five o'clock tomorrow evening, then you could be entered into a prize draw uh, for um, one of our Mini Beast Explorer kits. So I do hope that you can come and join us tomorrow. Apologies for not being able to get our video call connection with Henry working, but we will try and get those questions answered for you. Thank you for joining us and hopefully see you tomorrow.